You think the title is Accidental Presidents, and I know there are people who think that our own current president is an accidental president. How so? Of sorts. How, how so? How so? Because I think that if he... If you win Pennsylvania after... Uh, uh, meaning I think that even he at some point thinks it was an accident. Anyway, the point is, the book is not about President uh, okay. Trump. That's where I was it's, going it's, with it's this. What, it's, it's, it's what you're still hoping, that Pence is going to be president before 2020. Well, but well, Actually, that's a very interesting point that you make about Pence, because one of the most fascinating pieces in this book yes. is that we as a... Can I, can I speak for you? Please, second? absolutely. Um, we as a collective, as citizens, mm -hmm. often focus too much, I think Jared says in the book, on who the president is and not actually who the vice president is because oftentimes the vice president becomes the president. That's correct. So you like, have, you like have, in the Bush administration. Different, different topics. Sli slightly different. <laughs> I mean, the, in the book, you know, okay. I write about the eight times in history a U.S. president has died in office, right? So his, how history is literally changed by the beat of a heart. Uh, what's interesting is these men who were not the voters' choice, who were thrown on the ticket, you know, because they wanted to win a state or appease a constituency, right. end up presiding over the country during Reconstruction. Um, you know, at the height of World War II, at some of the most seminal moments of the Cold War, and yet they're an afterthought up until the very moment where they take the oath of office. Who is the most accidental of the accidental presidents that you describe in this book? Do you, do you look at and say, that was a true and utter accident? I mean, the, to me, the one you have to start with, with, uh, with, with John Tyler, because nobody thought it was going to happen. When William Henry Harrison is elected president in 1840, he dies 30 days later. Uh, the framers of the Constitution were completely unclear as to whether or not the vice president becomes the president or is just acting. So imagine this, you become, the president dies, the framers have left no blueprint for it, and the new acting president or president has to spend his first months figuring out, you know, how to convince Congress that he's president. He gets kicked out of his party, right. he rage annexes Texas in response. So if we think that impulsiveness is a modern phenomenon, I assure you it happened in the 1840s. We forgot about John Tyler. I mean, you got to go. Completely. Yeah. I, uh, thought how could, you, how could you forget? Because I thought you'd go with LBJ or something like something. Well, it's too that, predictable. That, but the, the remarkable one is. How about Spiro Agnew, who never became president? Well, the, the, the more remarkable one is, is Harry Truman, right? So what's interesting is everybody knew FDR was, was, was going to die when he was reelected in 1944, but nobody dared talk about it because nobody wanted to have that conversation. Truman's vice president for only 82 days. He meets FDR twice. He gets no intelligence briefings, meets no foreign leaders, wakes up one day, and he's presiding over the height of the war in the Asian Pacific theater. You know, Stalin's right. reneging on every one of his promises from Yalta. The other thing that I found so fascinating about this book was just how, you know, we think that we live in this, with the media and fake news and all of this, and, and the anger of both sides, that it's somehow terrible, that it's the worst it's ever been. And I, you know, as I read through the book, you'd think it was much worse back then. Well, you would think writing a book about presidents dying in office would lead to a melancholy type feeling. The book netted me out pretty optimistic because I did come away feeling like politics today is not as bad as they seem. Let's, let's take polarization as an example. People love to talk about how we're at the height of this sort of polarized moment. In the 1850s, you literally had a senator pull a gun on another senator in the chamber and try to shoot him over a debate on politics. You had a, a member of Congress come into the Senate and beat another senator with a cane right. nearly to death. So, you know, Back then, you know, if you didn't have your bullet wounds and your head bludgeoned, um, you hadn't made your right. point. Um, this may be a curveball for you, but we had a conversation with Ray Dalio on the set yesterday about the American dream and the state of capitalism and what that meant to America and the idea of free markets and freedom. When you look back at history, how do you think the American dream has changed? Mm. Do, you, do you have any thought in terms of what's, what's happened to here? Because there seems to be a big debate um, no, uh, I know you, you don't you, think there's been a big debate, debate no, but there, no. there has been a big debate. And, and, and as I was reading through the book, I thought there were sort of some interesting sort of thematic shifts. A guy worth 18 billion is worth that the American, worried the American dream's dead. So. But if you look at who's participating in politics today, it's far more accessible, not just for the people who are elected, but it's far more accessible for people to participate. I, I'm just sad that McCain didn't win so you could have Sarah Palin to talk about as an accidental president. He would have loved, can you imagine? See, your worst case scenario is not John Tyler or LBJ. What if that had happened, Andrew? It would have made for an, extra, <laughs> it would have made for an interesting chapter. Um, uh, fi final question, and it really has to do with social media, and, and, and you can speak to this given your experience with, with technology and everything else. How do you think the social media has changed? It's, I, I wonder whether you think it's better or worse right now given everything that's going on in terms of the election and how people should think about 2020. 
So I think if we, when we look back at history at this moment in time, we'll, I, th I think successive generations will look at this moment and define it as the period where we were trying to figure out how to navigate all the noise. But if you look at what's, what's happened, we're already at a point where people are demanding more substantive information. We're all overwhelmed and, um, and sort of overtaken by the sheer volume of information. So I think that in the context of an election, politicians have a harder time taking the pulse of the population. We're all prone to underreacting and overreacting, and that's true whether you're a politician or you're a voter. Exacerbated more today than 100 years ago? I think you have more voices today than you had 100 years ago, but the nastiness 100 years ago um, you know, was as present then as it is now.